Hi everyone, we're going to have a look at hypothesis testing now. I've split this lesson up into two parts. This first part is mostly about definitions and setting up hypothesis testing and basically what hypothesis testing is actually about. We're not going to do very many calculations, they come in the second part. Um, so not much actual math to do in this lesson, just some definitions to learn. But it's very important you understand the concepts behind this, otherwise it's really tricky to understand what's actually going on in the exam questions. So we'll talk through all the concepts behind it in this lesson. So this is what we're going to go over. Um, when we actually use hypothesis testing and what it's about, um, the null and alternative hypotheses and what they are, uh, significance level, what that's about, the critical region. Um, we'll talk about what that is. Actually calculating where the critical region is, we'll leave till part two. Um, One-tailed and two-tailed tests, what they're about, and we'll do uh, an exam style question based on the stuff we've learned in this lesson. So when do we actually use hypothesis testing? Well, it's a way of testing, um, it's testing our suspicions um, about a distribution are actually correct. So we, um, we use a sample to investigate if our suspicion um, could be correct. Now, in our case, this links into the binomial distribution, which we were looking at previously. We're going to use the binomial distribution to have a think about how likely it is that um, our distribution is correct or if it might actually be wrong. So here's some examples of hypotheses. So I believe the coin lands on heads more often than it should. So it's a suspicion that actually the probability that the coin lands on heads isn't a half, it's actually maybe more than a half. So that's our suspicion. Or I believe more customers are buying food than last month. So again, thinking that the proportion is more than it used to be. So it's all about comparing um, what we think about the data set, what, what we believe to be true, and our suspicion that it might have changed. We compare those two things in hypothesis testing um, and think about how we can show um, if the suspicion is likely to be true by using the binomial distribution. So we've got the null and the alternative hypothesis, hypotheses even. Um, the null hypothesis we call H0, so it's just some notation to get your head around. Um, this is just some notation for the null hypothesis, it's H, H0. It's our original assumption about a distribution. So in the coin example I just did on the previous page, our original assumption is probably that the coin is fair. So we're probably saying that our original assumption is that the probability of success is 0 0.5. That's probably our original assumption. And the alternative hypothesis is our suspicion about the distribution based on what we see. So on the previous one, we, we said that um, we believe the coin lands on heads more often than it should. So our suspicion is that the probability of success, the probability that it lands on heads is actually larger than a half. So in that case, we'd have our H0 might be that P is 0 0.5, the probability of success is 0 0.5, and the alternative is that P is larger than 0 0.5. We'll see much more about the alternative and the, the null hypotheses and how to formulate them in uh, later parts of this lesson. So both the null and the alternative hypotheses are written in terms of the probability of success. We always write it in terms of P, okay, just like I have here. Um, so these hypotheses are always written as P equals or P is larger than or whatever. The null hypothesis is always P equals something. So P equals 0 0.5 or for dice it's P equals a sixth probably is our original hypothesis. <clears throat> and the alternative is always written as P is larger than or P is less than or sometimes just that P is not equal to it. Now the outcome of a hypothesis test, what are we actually trying to achieve? Well, we want a result at the end to say whether we accept the null hypothesis, the original assumption we say, well, as far as we know, the null hypothesis is probably correct. Or if we say the null hypothesis is probably wrong, we're going to reject it and we're going to prefer and take the alternative hypothesis. So it's all about choosing between this null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Um, we'll favor the null hypothesis because it's our original assumption. So we need, we need evidence to say, that we're not going to take the null hypothesis and we're going to favor the alternative one instead and switch over to the alternative. So what's the significance level about? Well, we said we can either accept or reject the null hypothesis. Well, the significance level is the chance that we'll wrongly reject the null hypothesis, even though it's actually correct. So it's, say we have the coin that um, lands on heads exactly half the time, 
it's the chance we'll take that we actually say, no, it doesn't land on heads half the time, it lands on heads more than half the time, but actually we were wrong in it and the probability is just a half. Um, the reason this crops up is, say we say we toss a coin 10 times and it lands on heads eight times. Now, is the coin biased or did that just happen by luck? Well, we don't know really, to be honest. Um, we have to look at probabilities and that's what we use the binomial distribution for. So it's possible that we toss a coin 10 times, it lands on heads every time. It might not be biased, it might be perfectly fair and it just happened by chance. So there's a, always a chance that we'll wrongly reject the null hypothesis. And that's what the significance level is. It basically says how precise we need to be. It's normally 1%, 5% or 10%. 10% means 10% of the time we'll wrongly reject the null hypothesis. Um, or there's a 10% chance that we'll wrongly reject the null hypothesis. If we go down to 1%, it's quite a strict criteria, but it means we'll only be wrong 1% of the time, so it's a really good test. So the further down the significance levels we go, um, the more strict we're being about how much evidence we need to reject the null hypothesis. At 1%, we need loads of evidence to reject the null hypothesis, and it means we'll only be wrong 1% of the time. At 10%, we don't need too much evidence, but it means there's a good chance, or there's a 10% chance we'll be wrong. We can't be absolutely certain the null hypothesis is right or wrong. That's just the nature of statistics. You could throw a coin a hundred times, it would land on heads a hundred times. It's possible, it's just extremely unlikely. So we have to have a cutoff at some point where we say, right, this coin probably is biased, it lands on heads more than it should, but we can't be 100% certain, we can only be 99% certain or 99.9% .9 certain or whatever it is. So what about the critical region, what's that about? So when we take a sample to investigate the hypotheses, the null and the alternative hypotheses, the critical region is the number of successes in the sample that would cause us to reject the null hypothesis. So for instance, if we throw a coin 10 times um, and our null hypothesis that the coin is fair, and our alternative is that it lands on heads more than it should, we might say, well, if it lands on heads nine or more times, then we'll reject the null hypothesis. That would be a critical region. Our critical region would be nine or more times. Um, if we throw a coin 100 times, we might say, well, if it lands on heads more than 60 times, we'll reject the null hypothesis. OK, so it's, that's the kind of region we're looking at. We'll do some examples later on to clarify what all this means, by the way. And we're going to use the binomial distribution, which we learned about in the previous topic, to calculate where the critical region is. Those calculations will be in part two of hypothesis testing. As well as the critical region, we have something called the acceptance region. That's where we'll accept that the null hypothesis is probably correct. OK, so you've got the critical region where we'll reject the null hypothesis and the acceptance region where we'll accept the null hypothesis. So here's some examples to try and clear up all the stuff we've been talking about in the previous 10 minutes or so. So let's say we've got Sarah believes a coin lands on heads more often than a fair coin would. So let's try to formulate our hypotheses first. So our original assumption is that it's a fair coin. That's our original assumption here. Our alternative hypothesis is going to be that it lands on heads more often. OK, so this is the alternative H1. This is the original H0. OK, so the original hypothesis, uh, the null hypothesis is that P, the probability of getting heads in this case, is 0.5. That's what we're comparing against. Our suspicion, the alternative hypothesis, is that it lands on heads more often than a, than a fair coin would, so P is larger than 0.5 is our suspicion. So we're saying she takes a sample of 20 coin tosses, so she tosses a coin 20 times at a 5% level of significance, find the critical region. Okay, now um, we're going to do calculations of the critical region in the next section, so I'm just going to give you the answer to this basically, um, but it hopefully it'll explain how this works. Now, the critical region is if x is larger than or equal to 15. So what we're saying is if we throw the coin 20 times and we get 15 or more heads, then we would choose to accept, uh, sorry, reject the null hypothesis and take the alternative instead. So here, this red bit is the critical region. If there's that many heads, 15 or more, we would say we're going to reject the null hypothesis and we'd go for this one instead, the alternative hypothesis. This green bit is the acceptance region. If it's in this section, 
we accept the null hypothesis instead, so we accept the null. So in this region, we accept H naught. In this region, we say, well, it's pretty unlikely that the coin's fair and we've got 15 or more heads, so we're going to reject the null hypothesis and take the alternative hypothesis instead. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense how that's working. The critical region that we've got down here is always written in terms of X. Please don't write a critical region as probability of something. It doesn't make any sense. A critical region is not a probability. Um, it's, an, it's a region, okay? So it's a region of X. It's not, not a probability. So don't write that. It, examiners hate it. They've written in reports that that's something that crops up quite a lot that they don't like. So let's say the outcome of the sample was that the coin lands on head 16 times. So it's here somewhere. So what are we going to do? Well, it's in the it's in the critical region, isn't it? It's in the critical region. Because it's in the critical region, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? And we're going to say, well, it's pretty unlikely the coin's fair if it landed on head 16 times out of 20. Um, so we'll take the alternative hypothesis instead. Now, there's a 5% chance that we might be wrong, okay, uh, to have the critical region where it is. That's the that's what the significance level is. So we can't be absolutely sure that the null hypothesis is wrong, but it's quite likely that it's wrong in this case. Let's have a look at another example. So we've got a manager in a shop, and in the previous month, 20% of the new customers signed up for a loyalty card. He now thinks that less customers are signing up for a loyalty card this month. So our original assumption about the data is that it stayed the same 20% of new customers are signing up for the loyalty card that's our original but he now thinks less customers are so the null is that p is 0.2 or 20% the alternative is that it's reduced that p is now less than 0.2 remember in the alternative we never specify an exact value we just say that it's less than or larger than or not equal to the null hypothesis okay so he now takes a sample of 40 of his new customers and at 1% uh, level of significance, find the critical region. And it looks something like this. The critical region is that X is less than or equal to 2. Here's the critical region, this red bit here. So what we're saying is, of those 40 customers that we've sampled, if 2 or less of them signed up for a loyalty card, then, we've got, then we're in the critical region. However, any of the rest of it, we're in the acceptance region. Now remember in the acceptance region, we accept the null hypothesis. In the critical region, region, we reject the null hypothesis and take the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so we reject the null and say, well, the alternative is more likely if two or less customers signed up for the Lord's God. Don't worry about how I got this to at the moment. I'll show you that in the next lesson. This is just to show you what the critical region actually is. So let's say five customers signed up for the loyalty card. So we are here somewhere. You can see we're in the acceptance region. Okay, because we're in the acceptance region, we're going to accept the null hypothesis. There's not enough evidence to reject it. Okay, not enough evidence to reject it at 1% level of significance. So one-tailed and two-tailed test, what is that about? Well, what we've seen so far are examples of one-tailed tests. The... So these are two examples. Josh believes a larger proportion of customers are buying SUVs, or Josh believes a smaller proportion of customers are buying SUVs. The alternative hypotheses look like this. Maybe P is less than 0.2, or P is larger than 0.2. They've got a less than or a larger than sign, and the critical region just sits at one end. If it's less than, it'll look like this one. If it's larger than, it'll look like this top one. But in a two-tailed test, what we say instead is Josh believes the proportion of customers buying SUVs has changed. We don't specifically say that it's increased or decreased. We just say that it's changed. What that means is that we actually have two critical regions. We have one here and one here. Okay, so this might be something like P is not equal to 0.2, for instance. That would give us two critical regions, one on each side. Okay, one when it's too low and it indicates that 0.2 is wrong, and one where it's too many people indicating also the 0.2 might be wrong. So in a two-tailed test, we use the not equals to sign in the alternative hypothesis, and we get two red regions here, which are the critical regions. So let's do a two-tailed example. 
So Josh works in a car dealership. Records show that 25% of customers bought SUVs. And he believes the proportion of customers buying SUVs has changed. Well, the null hypothesis is the original assumption, 25% of customers. There's the null there. The alternative is that just that it's changed. We haven't said less than or more than, so we just put a not equals to sign. So this is going to be anything with a not equals to sign in the alternative hypothesis is going to be a two-tailed test. He takes a sample of 25 uh, customers at a 10% level of significance find the critical region. It looks something like this. You can say we've got two areas, we've got two critical regions. We've got a critical region down here where there's so few customers buying it, it would indicate that P is equals 0.25 is too high. And there's a critical region over here where there's so many um, customers buying SUVs that we'd say P equals 0.25 seems to be too low. Okay. And there's the acceptance region in the middle where we say, well, 0.25 is probably, probably reasonable, probably correct. Okay. So here for this sample, we actually have a critical region that X is less than or equal to two or that X is larger than or equal to 11. So let's say we've got 12 customers buy SUVs. Well, 12 is here somewhere. We're in the critical region, the top critical region. So we reject the null hypothesis and say, well, P is probably not 0.25. Um, it's too high in this case. So we'd reject the null hypothesis because we're in the critical region. 